All right. Well, hello and welcome to our recording of Conversations with CKG. My name is Sarah Jane Scoble, and I'm the Director of Mental Health Education at the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation. Conversations with CKG is our webinar series, and it's our way of starting some of the more difficult conversations. We want to talk about topics that are often shied away from or whispered about and bring them to light and have discussions that are educational and bring about awareness, um, all in an effort to provide you with tools to take along on your journey as you care for your mental health and the mental health of the teens in your lives. Um, it is September, it is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month, and we wanted to make sure that we took some time to talk about this because it is such a critical conversation. Um, suicide is not an easy subject, um, an easy topic of conversation, and when it comes to some of these topics, we so often think like, oh, I don't want to talk about that, that it might not be appropriate, it might be provoking, um, but in actuality, it is really critical that we have these conversations because they can quite literally save somebody's life um, by talking about these things and showing that they are important to you. Um, so we're doing things a little bit differently this time around. Um, we're pre-recording. We're having more of a little team conversation um, using some of our lived experience. I am joined today by our executive director, Grace Gallagher, and by Missy Minton, our director of operations and corporate sponsorship. So Grace and Missy, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation today. Thank you, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Well, Grace, I'll let you um, get started. I know we want to talk a little bit about um, who we are and what we do at CKG. If you want to go ahead and get us started. Yes, I'm excited to do that. So um, one thing I wanted to be clear about is that we are not mental health clinicians. We do have mental health training. Um, we, everyone that works at CKG has some training, but again, we are not clinicians. We are people with lived experience. We are people with a passion mm -hmm. to, um, to speak up for everyone's mental health. Um, and we are a proactive and preventative organization. We like to say that um, the three P's, positive, preventative, and proactive. And a lot of the um, education that we um, give to the students and to the teens everywhere is all about life skills and coping skills and recognizing feelings and understanding what's happening inside your body and really just connecting with yourself, giving yourself the vocabulary on how to speak about it, um, giving yourself the vocabulary to how to help friends, um, but it really needs to start with yourself, right? So we all need to take care of our own mental health in order to take care of others. Um, but I'm so excited about this conversation with CKG and this format we're doing because one of the most important things that we want to do is normalize these hard conversations. Normalizing it doesn't mean it, it takes away on how easy or hard it might be. It just means we need to have these conversations. There doesn't need to be a stigma involved when it comes to suicide. It's an important subject. It's a scary subject, but it's an important one. And here at CKG, we want to give everybody the life skills we absolutely can in order to help you understand and recognize some warning signs in your own body and in those in the people that are around you. Um, so again, this is just a casual, awesome conversation. Hopefully that you all take away a little something that um, you can sit around your kitchen table and talk about or go on a walk with your neighbor and talk about or on your lunch break with your coworker and, and have the conversation because um, in our opinion, knowledge is power. And with that, um, we can we truly, like Sarah said, can save some lives. Um, so from there, I'd love to um, turn it over to Missy. Um, and I know that she does have um, her title is Director of Operations and Corporate Sponsorships, but she does have um, she does have lived experience with um, with suicide and um, and some people in her community and some friends and some just dear family members. And I think it, first of all, Missy, I'd love to just start off with your, um, your feelings going into this conversation, right? Like how, you know, your feelings of like, why are we talking about this? And from your seat, not only at CKG, but as a parent, a friend, 
you know, what is it that you, you came to this conversation with and what would you like to share with our audience? Thank you, Grace. Um, I think you could take this, the start of this conversation in one of two ways. Like you said, it is extremely serious and it, it's a conversation that so many people shy away from. I really try very hard to look at this as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to give someone a valuable life skill. It's an opportunity to hopefully show uh, a parent, a caretaker, a teacher, a coach, a trusted individual in a teenager's life that they have the courage to start the conversation, that it really doesn't have to be that difficult or that intimidating. So I actually approach today with, I mean, obviously coming online and, and talking about these things, it's a little bit nerve wracking, but I also do it with a great deal of passion and enthusiasm because I am eager to share what I've seen in my community, which has been a lot of heartbreak over the last five to six years. Um, my experience as a mom of three girls, two of whom are teenagers, the youngest one is in middle school. So I am in the absolute throes of, of all of these feelings and conversations, having been part of our school's PTA, our high school booster, and of course with my work at CKG, I tend to be someone that people can come to to start that conversation. Um, I don't take that lightly. I take that with a great deal of honor. And I hope that there's something that comes out of our conversation today that teaches someone else to do the very same thing that I feel like I have done in my community. I agree. Um, the conversation is so important. And the conversation doesn't need to just be when somebody's in a dark spot or struggling. It right. needs to be a part of um, everyday conversation because we talk about, you know, did you take your vitamins today? Did you fill your water bottle up before mm -hmm. school? Is your homework mm -hmm. done? You know, all of that, it, it needs to be a part of our, our conversation daily. Um, another question I'd like to ask you, Missy, because you and I are about the same age and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not that old, <laughs> um, but it was a different conversation when we were in high school, right? Um, so was. can you share where we've come from what you, um, I can tell you what I thought about in, in my high school experience, but mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you first on um, where you think the conversation started in, in your experience in high school and where it is now. It, it was definitely in a, in a hushed corner. Um, when you brought this up, I was immediately brought back to, um, we lost two classmates when I was in high school to suicide. Um, and I remember one of them was somebody that I didn't know very well. And, and I distinctly remember the conversation around him was, oh, he's a loner. Um, you know, he didn't really have um, a lot of friends and nothing really more was, was really said about it. Um, the other one w was a friend of mine and, and he, he died, um, um, with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And I remember the pure grief um, that surrounded his family after that. But what I also do remember was that after that very short time frame, there was nothing really as a follow-up. There was no follow-up conversation. There were no peer-led groups. Um, there wasn't um, meetings with school counselors for that type of support that students needed. It was an incredibly confusing time. And so where I've seen this evolve is that there are more resources out there. There are individuals, there are counselors, there are there are teachers, um, and certainly more parent, parent support groups that are willing to um, be there for kids um, in the follow-up and the aftermath of a tragedy such as this that did not exist. I also recall that my parents didn't talk to me about it. They never asked me how, you know, I felt about it. And they are certainly of, of an age um, and grew up in a time where you did not discuss those types of things. That was like an inappropriate conversation to have. So I, I've seen the pendulum swing from one, one way all the way over to the other um, in the position that we're in now. I agree. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think um, like we said, knowledge is power. And I think people, um, especially generations back, were afraid to talk about it. They mm -hmm. were afraid it was going to give um, give people the idea of suicide. And that was their thought. If, if you talk about it, then you put it in their head. And then what if they mm -hmm. do something with that? 
And I wanted to share with you all um, in our audience some an article that I found. Um, and if you're not aware of this, there is a crisis text line. It's 988. And you can text anytime. Um, you, you may not be in, in a, a severe crisis, but before you get there, still text. If you're in a really dark place and you feel alone and you've got some scary thoughts going through your head, you know, it, it's a good time to, to text the crisis text line, 988. Just put, just everyone write that down, put it in your phone. Um, they're there for you. And it has truly helped so many, not just teens, but humans all over the, um, the age and gender spectrum. Um, but one of the things I want to read from you is they have done a lot of research because they took it seriously from maybe an older generation that was afraid to talk about suicide. And I want to read this to you on what they found. Overwhelmingly, we have found that it is essential to lead with empathy and ask direct questions when people are in emotional pain. And the most important question to ask that most in crisis is, do you have thoughts of death or dying? After using artificial intelligence to analyze our data set of 75 million text messages, collected since the crisis text line launched in 2013, we found that assessing suicide risk with an expression of care was most likely to reduce a texter's suicidal feelings. So I think the real important thing to hear there is yes, we have to talk about it. Um, and then when you're worried about someone, you will never regret asking, have you thought about hurting yourself? Have you thought about ending your life? The follow-up question to both of those, and um, follow-up question to those questions is, do you have a plan? And in leading with empathy is, is, the direct question is very important, but to lead it with empathy and not accusatory will get the truth and then you can help. If they feel like they are being, having to defend what their scary thoughts are, then they're gonna think they're in trouble. And we need everyone to know that I'm asking because I care and I want to be there. And I may not have the answers, but let's talk about this. And, and it's really important, it's scary. We don't, we, don't want, we don't wanna hear from the people that we love or the people that we're worried about that they're thinking about hurting themselves. And I'll just share um, a quick story um, about me as a mom and Cameron, when she was about 14 or 15 years old. And, um, you know, as you all know, that Cameron suffered from depression and anxiety. And she, um, she was scared. She was really scared of her own thoughts. And she was really lonely in her own thoughts. And if you think about that as an adult, we've, we've been scared in our own thoughts before, but you put it into a teenager's developmental mind, they don't know that there is another side, that this is really hard, but the wave will stop crashing and you will float to the front. And their, their frontal lobe cannot process that. So it's very important that, um, that we tell our teens and anyone in our life, if you're starting to have scary thoughts, please let's talk about them. Please come to me. And so she did, she came to me one night and she was like, I'm really, really scared. I. I don't want to hurt myself, but I don't know if I can stop this. And as a parent, whew, that is hard. That is really hard because you immediately start going into yourself saying, what have I done wrong? What, if, what, what should I have done differently? This, this, and you have to take a breath and you have to say, this is not about me, that this person in front of me is suffering and struggling. So I need to stop the negative voice in my head and just be fully present, as scary as that conversation may be, be fully present and right there with my child. And what we did that night is I just laid in bed with her and held her hands. And I said, I wish I could stop your scary thoughts, but I will be here to stop you from hurting yourself. And I will hold your hands until you wake up the next morning and we'll, we'll go to the next morning tomorrow. But tonight, just feel safe with me. I'm right here with you. And so as a parent, of course, I didn't sleep the whole night, right? 
but I held her hands and I knew I had enough time to calm down and say, I don't have to have all the answers. The answer was she came to me. The answer was she admitted she had scary thoughts. And then I could go to my pediatrician the next day, her psychologist, my husband, and we could come together and be like, okay, we don't, our plan is right now just to stay close. And then we'll have a plan for the next hour. And you just need to take it one step at a time. So personally, I know what it feels like to be scared for your child. I know how heavy of a burden that carries all throughout your day and you can't stop thinking about it. But if you really take that second to step back and say, they came to me. And why did she come to me? Because I told all my kids before Cameron was suffering, if you're having scary thoughts, it may be a six-year-old saying, I am feeling worried about everything and I don't know why. And they just start crying and they're just really big feelings, right? If you start early enough and say, let's talk about those scary thoughts. We're not going to ignore them. We're going to walk through them. We might be scared together and we're going to get to the other side. So that was my personal experience um, with, with a child that was truly in a dark place. Um, but I can't reiterate enough to all of us in the audience and everyone out there, please don't be scared to talk about this. I mean, we've got the, the data and all of the different, we've got it from the crisis Texas text line. We've got it from psychology today. Talking about suicide does not cause suicidal thoughts. If you could compare it to when Mothers Against Drunk Driving started, we had to talk to our kids, even though we didn't want our high schoolers drinking, much less drinking and driving. We talked about it and look at the rates that went down mm -hmm. in, in teenage car accidents due to drinking and driving. Look at how that happened. So let's not be afraid. It, recognize it's scary, but let's do it together. Missy, I know you've had, unfortunately, I had to speak at some funerals really on, on, and talk to the kids after they've lost a very close um, classmate. So if there's anything out there you want to share from your life experience and in that area, I know all of us as parents and caregivers and teachers and coaches and neighbors, you know, sometimes we need help with the vocabulary and, and maybe sharing with some of the conversations you've had and the experience you've had could be pretty helpful. Sure. Um, first of all, you know, it's it's really important to recognize when those signs start um, from when they're young and it's the, the tummy ache going to school um, to middle school and transitions and um, and then to the academic pressures of high school, which is actually kind of where where I am right now as a mom. So I'll, you know, explain a little bit more about that. Um, my oldest is. Um, She's a great student, uh, straight A student. She's never made a B. Um, she's a competitive swimmer. She swims 11 months you know, out of the year. And we knew junior year of high school was going to be really tough. Um, and so there was this point in, in the school year, you know, where she was like, I I, I don't know how I'm going to do all this. I, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to have time for all of this. And hers was really more about you know, her anxiety. And it was really important for me to recognize that um, specifically when you have a high achieving student or student athlete, um, when they're trying to balance all the pressure that is put on them, um, and you know, in order to get into um, this school, you have to have this type of rigor in your academics, or you need to be in this club, you need to hold this office, you need to do this many community service hours. And and trust me, I'm I'm in the thick of that, you know, with her. Um, and we don't really realize, I think, as a as a society, the pressure we're putting on these teenagers to achieve at leaps and bounds really above and beyond what we had to do in order to get into um, a good school or, or that the four-year college is the only avenue of, of success for a student and not thinking that perhaps Perhaps my child is not quite ready for college. Perhaps they need that gap year, or maybe they need a, a semester at our local community college just to bridge that gap in transitions. 
And so, you know, I say to parents out there, um, having had friends, our, our very good friends who just sent their, their children off to their first year of college, that it, so many changes and so many things coming at teenagers today, much more so at a much faster rate than what, Grace, you and I had um, growing up as teenagers. You couple that with the phones and the social media, and we're really creating this perfect storm. And it was really important to um, my husband and I that we provide as much opportunity away from those pressures as possible. For example, it is super important that we have phone free time in our house. It is super important that we get time away, weekends and family time. It's important that teenagers have that healthy outlet. Um, for my oldest daughter, hers is she likes to jog. She loves to play the piano. She loves to sing. And she needs to be able to, to do any one of those, um, those positive and preventative and proactive skills in order to maintain, you know, the balance of her of her mental health. Um, I, I know that when I come home and I find her at the piano, I know that she's in the middle of expressing I'm having a tough day. It's all really a lot right now. And this is something, you know, that I need. It does make me think a lot about um, in our community, there's been something like six male suicides, um, as well as one female suicide over the last five to six years. And it's heartbreaking. I, I mean, it, there actually, there are really no words to, words to describe that. And it caused me to do some research on what is a trusted adult for a teenager, because we as parents, like Grace said, we open up the conversation. We let them know that we are we're their number one safe space. But we have to be honest with ourselves and say that you know maybe sometimes we are not it. And and as much as a school counselor wants to be that person, there's a lot of pressure on a school counselor to perform many duties in a school. So where are our kids spending the most amount of time? For my kids, they are with their coaches quite a bit. And sometimes their coaches will see, you know, a, a child, a teenager, more waking hours than a parent might in a week. Um, and doing a little digging with our with our surrounding counties here, it's almost 50 percent of high school coaches are not employees of the county. In other words, they're just hired in to, you know, to coach that particular sport. They're not an employee of the school. So that made me, you know, kind of ask myself. Um, as as well as ask the powers that be, what kind of mental health training are they getting um, to prepare themselves to be that trusted individual? And honestly, the answer there is probably not a lot. So we need to arm our you know our community with the resources. These these coaches, these teachers, they they have so much on them, you know, as it is. But they also need the resources. To in order to navigate those difficult conversations, I feel so fortunate um, that my daughter can come and, and talk to me. I mean, she knows she's basically been raised through the CKG Foundation. Um, as I started work here eight years ago, when she was just eight nine years old, um, and then my youngest child was just you know was just a baby. So we we all know how to hit our pause button. We all know how to reflect and respond. We know how to take that that deep breath and just let some things go. Um, but when it goes beyond that, when it starts to interfere with sleep, when you see the, the patterns of behavior changing, when you see them retreat away from the things that they love doing, when the, the eating um, behaviors change, when the friendships change, that's when the conversations really need to begin. And every child, Every teenager needs to have those trusted individuals. That is what I see the most in in, in my county, um, and in, with the tragedies that have befallen, you know, on us. A lot of it had to do with um, athletic pressures, the pressure to be perfect, the pressure to make that right decision for their future at 17 years old, and and it's just too much. Sometimes it's just simply too much. I wish collectively as a society, we could just take that step back and allow them to be kids 
for just a little bit longer before they have to make these decisions. I wish we made it more acceptable um, for kids to navigate on a gap year or community college. I know it's out there as a resource, but when we have signing days, when we have um, college announcement days, and you know all of these things that are kind of the more norm that get supported in the public, it makes other kids who don't feel like they're ready for that, like they are a failure. And that's kind of where, that's the seat that I'm sitting in as a parent. I, I know the challenges that are in front of my child this year as she starts to navigate those decisions. We have absolutely 100% told her, if you decide that you want to stay home and go to community college for a year or two, or you want to travel as part of a gap year, we absolutely will support that. And as parents, I can tell you, we have to be 100% unafraid of what your neighbor, uh, of what your keeping up with somebody else on the sports team, what any of them are thinking, you must always do what is best for your child. And what may be best for your child is a wholly different path than what society has prescribed as a norm. And in order, I think, to do that, we must arm our specifically, I, you know, where, again, where I am, our coaches, our the people who are spending that time with our, our teenagers, with our youth, with those resources to make it okay, to make mm -hmm. that decision okay. So that's- I couldn't agree with you more. I think, um, yeah. I think there's um, the coaches, the school nurses, um, they see a lot, you know, Sarah and I talked earlier about sometimes, um, you know, the, st the stomach aches that the the little kindergartners might come into and, and talk about and, and they don't, and that's a great way to arm our school nurses with like, oh, your stomach hurts and, and validate that like you're it is a very real feeling when you're feeling anxious right. or worried, that right. your stomach's gonna hurt. So right. I think really um, arming our all the people in our children's lives with with the right training. I think the other thing that's really important that you um, touched on, Missy, is like we have got to tell our children it's okay to have trusted adults that are not us. Mm -hmm. They need that permission. And, and, and to ask them to please take a second and program those into their phone so they don't have to think about it later. And maybe in the notes section, just say trusted adult. And, and they need the permission to be like, you're not in trouble if you need to go to another person. The, the importance of you being here on this earth in the healthiest state you can be in at any given moment time is the priority. I think the other conversation when we, when we talk about um, suicide awareness um, is we, you know, how many times have we all heard, oh, we didn't see this coming, mm -hmm. right? We didn't know. Um, maybe it wasn't an athlete that with with a lot of pressures. Maybe it was just somebody that just floated on through life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and everybody's always surprised. And I think the other the other really important thing to have the conversations with your family, with your team, if you're a coach, um, with your neighbors is, you know, there's a mask we all wear, right? I don't always feel great showing up to work. I feel great when I see my team and, but, you know, sometimes you, you put on that smile and you're not really feeling that smile. Um, I know that Sarah, a lot of our programming and educational, we talk about the um, invisible backpack. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have that conversation, whether you are a parent, teacher, grandparent, caregiver, mentor, whoever you are, I think having that conversation and, and really saying, you know, I carry an invisible backpack sometimes and sometimes my the very closest person in my life to me doesn't even know how heavy it is because I just I'm just carrying it or sometimes I wear a mask and really it gives the um I think the teens and the students and the and all children and the words and the permission to be like oh wow I didn't know other people were carrying around a lot of a heavy burden maybe I can share a little bit of that um and also at, at CKG, we're very aware that there's a lot of different cultures that that speak to mental health in a different way. And that's okay. 
And I think part of understanding what your culture is and defining in your family that culture um, and and how how you talk about it shouldn't stop you from talking about it. It should just help you learn how to navigate that. Um, we have a great digital toolkit called Cultural Sensitivity that is a good way to start. And um, maybe if you're a, a teacher who has a student that's coming um, to you and, and sharing some scary thoughts, and maybe they're not from the same culture that you are, and maybe that is a good way to start on helping to understand the vocabulary. Um, I've talked to a lot of different people who um, who don't look like me and, and don't have the same life as me. And the way they talk about mental health is important. And I can't just say the way, the way I may address my child's um, suicidal thoughts is maybe very different from somebody else. And in my own family, having the age difference that I have, um, Sarah's got a little toddler. And so she may start in a different way speaking about um, and not not saying to her sweet little daughter, are you having suicidal thoughts at two years old? But you may be saying, you know, things like, um, are your feelings really big right now? You know, and, and I think it it's different from when you're talking to a child that age to when you are dealing with a middle schooler or a high schooler or a college student. You know, transitions are hard. Transitions are really hard for um, for parents as well. And navigating how to parent through those different developmental stages is important. Um, another thing I'd really like to bring up on this um, wonderful talk I'm having with my team is we have a, um, a little um, marketing material here um, and it'll be lives on our website and Sarah will send it with the notes and some other resources we have um, after um, after we finish this beautiful conversation and yes it is beautiful because it's an important conversation um, but it, it talks about how to help a friend um, a lot of our, our um, kids get texts that they they don't know what to do with they're worried about their friends. They're worried um, if I tell someone, is my friend gonna be mad at me? Um, I've gotten that phone call when Cameron was in high school, a friend's calling saying, I'm just really worried about her right now. Um, please don't tell her I told you. Um, I always start with thank you, even if it was something I didn't wanna hear, right? You know, I got a, a call from a friend that said, I noticed there was a cut on Cameron's leg and I know it wasn't because of any other reason that she, then she hurt herself. And um, did I wanna hear that? No. And in all honesty was my first reaction, anger, yes, because anger and fear go together. But my first comment to this friend of Cameron's was thank you. You did the right thing. And if another friend of yours ever says something to you, you will never regret telling them. And I respect your privacy and I respect your trust. The most important thing is that you put your, your own fear of losing a friend aside to save the life of another friend. Sometimes the, the conversations aren't that deep and dark that your, your, um, our children are having with each other. So I just wanted to share a couple of things that we have on here about how to help a friend, which I think is super important for our, our children to know what is their responsibility and what it's not. They're not adults yet. These are big, huge problems that we don't know how to figure out all the time. So letting our, our children know, hey, you don't, you don't have to figure this out. We're going to help you. But here are some things you can do in your world, in your age group. It, um, you can say, I'm here. If somebody says, I'm scared, all you have to say, I'm here. Even if it's over a text, I'm here. You don't have to go through this alone. You know, um, if they're texting you, you can say, do you want to talk? Um, some questions you can ask them. Did you get outside today? Maybe tomorrow we can go on a walk. Um, tell me, and this is a really important one for a friend to ask. Tell me what is not helpful when things are hard. You know, some and when you have that conversation, if you tell somebody, oh, just don't worry about it, wouldn't that be easy for all of us? Oh, if that's all I had to do is not worry about it, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> um, do you have a playlist that lifts you up? How are you sleeping? Have you eaten today? Do you have a goal for today? Can I help you achieve it? Can I drive you to get help? Can I wait? 
and hear from you after your next appointment. This lives on our website. So it's something really important that you can um, share with your children. Um, and one more thing, and, and I am going to end this on a very positive note, but I do feel like that we have to um, discuss this one difficult part is our children have experienced friends, family members that have taken their lives. They have, and it's sad and it's scary. And Missy, I know that you had to speak at a very dear friend's funeral. Um, and there was a whole high school there of, of mm -hmm. children just holding on to hope for something. And could you just share in the next maybe like one or two minutes on the, the, the empathy you shared with them, the heart you gave them, and the hope that you gave them in that conversation at this beautiful person's funeral? Well, I, I'd like to think that I did do all of those things. And to be fair, um, when you go into a moment like that, it's it, it's incredibly like, it's a very, I felt so responsible for what their next thoughts were gonna be. Um, the church was completely filled and um, around the walls and back through the doors and um, people were standing, but distinctly remember looking to the right side of the congregation where a majority of the students, you know, were sitting and, and weeping. And I remember sharing Cameron's story with them because that was important that they knew why I was there. And I remember looking at them in their very hurt eyes and saying and acknowledging some of you maybe weren't kind to this person. Some of you potentially ignored the warning signs, the things that you saw, you heard things. Um, some of you did your very best to help and you are just completely shattered by the fact that you weren't able to reach them. I tried for that conversation to be an opportunity for a new day because they have to see that the things that they did from the very next day forward could matter to someone. Maybe they were a source of pain to someone. Maybe they weren't able to reach this particular person, but they had an opportunity to, to lift someone else up. They had an opportunity to start a conversation that they ignored. Grace, you mentioned the, the how to help a friend card. And then that leads me to, to isolation. So often we see kids who don't have a very close network of friends, if they have any at all. And they were the kids who probably sat alone at the lunch table. I challenged those students that day. You walk by kids every day who maybe don't belong to your, your friend group. They maybe don't dress the same way that you do. And yesterday you maybe would have ignored them, but tomorrow, tomorrow you can say hi. Tomorrow you can give someone just a high five in the hallway. And that very little thing, that very little spark can ignite a flame. And then we don't have to meet here again. Yes, it's so true. It's so true. And um, and I think that we do have a, our, our children are humans. We're human. We're not always the best human mm -hmm. that we want to be. But if we focus on the next step, recognizing when you were trying, recognizing what was in your control and not in con your control, recognizing that so this is not your fault. Um, then just taking that pain that you have and putting it to purpose and saying, I can be 10% better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Because maybe that's the only thing that you have in you to give because you're carrying your pain, right? Um, right but you can use that and, and your pain can be something beautiful and a beautiful light. Um, and for all those out there who are survivors of families and friends that have taken their life, I had a, a really um, impactful conversation with a friend who lost her husband by suicide. And she said one of the most beautiful things to her children. She said, you are more than your first thoughts in this world. And you're more than your last thoughts in this world. Mm -hmm. And um, so everybody out there that has lost, please hold on to that. I hope that gives you a little bit of hope. 
and know that all the beautiful lights that are not here on earth, but maybe are shining in the stars above us at night, of those that have lost their lives by suicide, know that we hold them and we carry them and we cherish them. And we shine that light onto every bit of work that we do at CKG. And um, with this, um, I'm gonna let Sarah kind of wrap it up with some, some resources and some other things that we may have to offer you all. But thank you for taking the time to sit and listen maybe uncomfortably, um, but we, we can all grow from this. There's hope here. Suicide awareness is not does not have to be a dark conversation. It has to be a hard conversation, but it does not have to be a dark one. And there's hope in that because the more we talk about this and the more we give to each other vocabulary and shared experiences, that loneliness, that isolation starts to dissipate and hope starts to become right there. And just remember, if there's somebody in your life that does not have hope, tell them that's okay, that you will hold their hope for them till they can get there. So I appreciate everybody listening. I appreciate Missy sharing some very difficult um, experiences in her life. I appreciate Sarah being willing and brave enough to bring this out to all of you out there in the audience listening. And just remember, as Cameron wrote on her walls, you are worth it all. So Sarah, I'll let you wrap it up with all of what we have to offer. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Missy. Um, yeah, so this recording is going to live on our website. It will live on our YouTube channel. So you will have it available to you at any time. Um, and we'll also include some other resources um, in our email so that you have those to keep with you as well, including that how to help a friend card. Um, and just to reiterate, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, that 988 number is open all the time. You can call it, text it if you're in crisis. You can even go on their website and use the chat feature. Um, so just remember that that 988 number is always available to you. Um, thank you all for watching. We hope that you're able to take away some tools for your toolbox, for yourself, for the teens in your life. Um, and thank you for taking the initiative to speak up and to just be there for those teens. Thank you.